Hi, I'm Kevin Clark, Chief Correspondent and Senior Editor at America Media. Today we're speaking with Archbishop William Laurie in Baltimore. We're going to be talking a little bit about conditions in Baltimore and, uh, and what the church's role might be in reconciliation and uh, moving ahead uh, through this crisis. Um, Archbishop Laurie, thank you so much for speaking with us today. Uh, glad, to, glad to be with you. Thank you. Um, could you tell us now, we, we, it seems like there's been a quieter night than, uh, of course, the other night when there was a great deal of violence. Can you give us an update of conditions today in Baltimore and West Baltimore? Sure. Of course, the worst day was Monday, and that's when so much of the looting and burning and real anger erupted, even in the midst of, of, of some peaceful protests. Last, uh, the first night of the curfew was, was calmer. And then last night, there was a very large, peaceful demonstration that took place around City Hall, and that apparently went fine. Today, I'm not really sure what's underway. I'm not sure anybody knows exactly what to expect. I think we are looking ahead, though, to something pretty major on the weekend, Saturday especially. Uh, by major, you mean a large-scale demonstration? A large-scale demonstration, yeah. I think we'll be seeing that on, on the weekend. Okay. Well, what do you think the, uh, the role of the church should be in responding to this crisis? Well, we're not a police force. We're not, a, we're not the government. We are a community of faith. And what does our faith mostly tell us all the time, but especially in a situation like this? It tells us that we should be um, a force for peace, for justice, for reconciliation, and bridge building. And I think that has to be done in lots and lots of ways. I think uh, we're constantly building bridges in our own parishes between clergy and, and, and people and among our parishes. I think uh, the, the, the church, the parish is a great catalyst for helping uh, bring together family structures because what is really so necessary, especially for the young people, is that they have some kind of a home, that there be a place of peace and security, a place where they have dinner. Maybe not every night, like was the case in, in times past, but once in a while. Uh, I think that we play a role in building bridges uh, as well uh, with community organizers, leaders, and um, law enforcement. Um, in addition to that, uh, we're a place that um, provides a lot of services. Um, we have, for example, senior employment, senior housing, child daycare, food pantries, health care. Uh, right in the city, St. Agnes and Monsecour, Head Start, Behavioral Health in three public schools, employment services, a crisis intervention, uh, especially for children. Uh, and, um, and that's huge. And Catholic Charities, which is outsized for the size the Archdiocese is, is really in and of the city. The other thing we do, of course, is educate. And we have our community schools, which are doing a wonderful job, um, struggling financially, but they're like the little engine that could. Um, and I think in addition to that, of course, um, the big thing you kind of look to uh, a church to be, uh, in addition to being a, a, a force for reconciliation and peace and justice, is hope. Hope is in really short supply in these neighborhoods. And sometimes we look at their anger and a lot of people just first and only thing they can say is, is words of condemnation. But I think if, if, if one lived in those conditions and neighborhoods and saw no way out, the anger, the boiling over uh, becomes not justifiable, but understandable. Do you, you know, speaking of that frustration, uh, you know, a lot of people across the country saw the TV Im images on CNN, and they, they were surprised to see in, in Baltimore this kind of uh, an uprising taking place. 
Can you talk about the conditions in the city that you think, are, what are the underlying conditions that, uh, that maybe are finding expression in some of the angrier uh, uh, incidents that we've seen the last few days? Sure. Uh, we are a very diverse city, uh, and sometimes people will speak of two Baltimores. There's parts of Baltimore that are up and coming. There's cranes in the air. There's old housing being rehabbed. There are um, businesses opening. Uh, and there's old neighborhoods that have maintained themselves uh, beautifully. And thank God, because a, a city needs to have that. Uh, but there's another Baltimore, and, uh, and it's especially uh, found in West Baltimore, but many, many neighborhoods in East Baltimore as well, uh, and where chronically bad conditions have existed for generations. And so, for example, uh, let's take the Sandtown, Winchester area. Every neighborhood in Baltimore has a name uh, because we are really not a, a city. We are a collection of little communities here in Baltimore. In that area, um, just if you take the adult um, employable population, um, about 52% are unemployed. Um, there's no jobs in the area, so fully 30% have to travel more than 45 minutes to uh, find it, to, to, to go to their job. The uh, median income, about $24,000, 25% on food stamps. Schools, uh, for all the money that's put in the public schools, and I want them to succeed very, very much, they're not succeeding, and there's significant dropout rate in Baltimore. Huge drop, dropout, and the and, and the truancy rate—that's a really old-fashioned word—but the yeah. truancy rate is about fifty yeah. percent. Um, population having less than a high school diploma, over fifty percent, sixty-one percent. Narcotics, drugs. So there's a whole series of systemic problems, and then you have the feeling on the part of residents there, many of them, I don't speak for all of them, that they're kind of disenfranchised. doesn't matter who's running the government. They just don't feel they've been listened to. They don't feel the bridges have been built to law enforcement. Again, there's many wonderful people in law enforcement doing heroic work, but there is the general feeling that the bridge has, uh, has not been built, mm -hmm. as it should be. So I think what happens is that these systemic problems roll along and then when uh, an event like the death of Freddie Gray comes up, these things bubble to the surface. I think that's what we've seen. Well, and the, I mean, I don't want to downplay the, the problems with, with the potential issue of police brutality in Baltimore either. The, the Baltimore Sun had a pretty scathing report on, on uh, you know, the, the, the million dollar cops out there that are causing uh, a big headache for the city in terms of its community relations. But um, you're suggesting that it's, what we're seeing is an expression of, of a broad level of frustration and a sense of isolation and abandonment in the African American community in Baltimore. And that's what I'm hearing, uh, that's what I've heard since I've been here mm -hmm. from pastors, that's what I've heard from parishioners when I met with parish councils. Uh, that's what I hear uh, from Catholic charities and, and those who are out and about in the community every day. The one thing I'll say about this archdiocese, and one of the reasons I fell in love with it quickly, is I realize what a, a good heart it has and how much it is in and of each of these communities. And uh, we would be the first ones to say, it's not enough. We would be the first ones to say we have to build more bridges. Mm -hmm. But um, but I think our commitment to the city is important. I think other churches, and we're, we're working with uh, some of the uh, large African American churches uh, in town, and some of those major pastors, um, is 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 very vital as well. I think as we go forward, I think we have to strengthen those ties. We're also blessed to have wonderful universities in the city. 
they know a lot, mm -hmm. a lot of expertise, not just about urban problems in general, which are hugely important, but for me, for the church I serve, we want to understand better the ones that are right here. So I think it's a community-wide uh, conversation. I think the church can be a catalyst in it. Have you been able to take this conversation to the, the white Catholic part of Baltimore and, and help them to uh, understand the conditions in other parts of Baltimore where this, this frustration is expressing itself? Yes, and uh, I think that that is something that um, has to be done again and again. And um, uh, it's a very interesting thing the way a Baltimore is organized or maybe not so organized. Um, and I discovered this right away. You, you can be going along and there is what appears to be a very prosperous neighborhood or an old neighborhood that has hold, held its own. And then a block or two away, the conditions like those I just described. Yeah, we're kind of we are um, we are well. It's it's just like that. It's a it's a it's a city of neighborhoods, and 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 some have held their own, some have not, and they're all juxtaposed. I think living in the city of Baltimore, you're aware of that, but there is a, a greater social consciousness out and about. For example, one of our most famous parishes in the Archdiocese, Nativity, um, which is fairly far removed from, um, from the epicenter, nonetheless is having a, a tremendous uh, service for justice and peace in, in, in Baltimore. Mm -hmm. And I was heartened to see how many of the uh, parishes that not only ring the city, but are out even farther, are doing the same thing. Now, are, are you going to be going to this demonstration uh, uh, on the weekend? Do you think there'll be a significant Catholic presence at this demonstration? Well, I think there will be. Uh, I, will um, I think that there is, there is something on Sunday mm -hmm. that is for all the clergy of the city that is being organized. I will s definitely be a part of that. I'm not exactly sure what Saturday will bring, but I'll tell you one of the things I thought might be the most important thing I could do, which is to gather with a group of pastors and ask them to brainstorm with me on how to, uh, how to continue the conversation of building bridges. Mm -hmm. and that's, that will certainly occur on Saturday and then get ready for a, for the events of Sunday. Do you think you'll be talking about the issue of, of police brutality or uh, uh, Black Lives Matter or the fact that uh, there seems to be a trend of uh, uh, this sort of over uh, overreaction on police to uh, unarmed black uh, young men? Is that going to be part of the conversation you're going to have? Undoubtedly. Undoubtedly. Mm -hmm. um, just to say two things about this. Number one, um, Certainly, we have to recognize those who do their job well every day mm -hmm. and who put their lives on the line and who enjoy support in the community, and we saw some of that. Uh, but then we have to recognize, and it's true in almost any profession, including my own, of people who, um, who not only err, but they err intentionally mm -hmm. and who um, treat people in a way that is uh, brutal and unjustified with excessive force and who sometimes target people because of the color of their skin. There can be no question that that is an issue that has to be uh, talked out thoroughly and that we would be uh, looking to the civic authorities uh, to, to address. But the community has to be heard. Um, Certainly they are being heard by protests, peaceful and otherwise. If ever there was a moment when everyone's attention was gotten, this is it. But here's what worries me. When everybody goes home and the news media is gone, and uh, this is not the news story du jour, and Lord knows it pains me to see it like that, that's when the real test comes. Yeah. 
Are we going to just go back to business as usual? Or are we going to have these conversations? Do you think that something more significant has to be attempted? I'm not speaking now just about the problem of the potential problem of police brutality uh, or even uh, malfeasance uh, to the point of homicide. Uh, about the, you know, there's a string of cities now where the kind of same conditions exist low educational attainment, poor job opportunities, poor infrastructure, public transportation. As you say, it's hard to get to jobs even if there were jobs. I'm thinking of Baltimore, Camden, Ferguson. Uh, any number, Youngstown, any number of Rust Belt cities across the United States where the jobs have been gone for decades now. Is it time for the country to really sit down and look at this as a systemic issue instead of uh, sort of responding in this piecemeal fashion that it, that it has? I'm thinking, of, you know, in the 60s we had the Kerner Commission looking at, uh, you know, the, the riots that after the riots took place in, in the late 60s. Do you think we're reaching that point now where we have to have a national conversation about you know, some of our declining urban areas, or struggling urban areas, I should say. Sure it is. I think it's overdue. And I think that as, as, as members of the church, leaders and members, we have to equip ourselves mm -hmm. to participate in such a conversation. And even now, the bishops who have had um, these situations arise in their own dioceses, at least informally, we we are in touch. If only to to express support for one another. If only to say we're thinking and praying about each other. Seems to me that is there should be a conversation about this um, in the church, and it should be a national one. And I think we who face these situations locally have to be informed participants in such a discussion. But then I do think we should also have a, um, a, a national conversation that brings stakeholders to the table and that results in uh, looking at, at what we need to do to address systemic problems. That's probably the word we're looking at. Structural sin applies and systemic problems applies, as far as I can see here. Okay, well, I'm going to have to ask you one more question, Archbishop Laurie, and then I'll let you go. I know you have more important things to do than talk to me. How, um, in, the, in the midst of this uh, d depressing, really, uh, turn of events, how do you find hope, and how do you communicate that hope to, uh, to your parishioners? Um, I think hope comes from the first of our relationships, and that's the relationship with the Lord the Lord who became poor for our sake uh, so that we might become rich and, and rich in the way that really counts, which is sharing God's own life and love. Um, it seems to me that that's why our first instinct in these moments is to go and to pray because prayer is, uh, is that moment when the hope that was implanted in us in baptism is stirred to life again. Uh, hope is what makes us um, believe in the dignity of human person, believe in it endlessly, believe that no matter how bad the situation is, uh, we should never give up and that we should keep going. Because there is a God of love and because there is a God of mercy, we derive the strength to try to build a civilization of love. We may succeed, we may fail, but the... Um, we keep striving. But, but the impetus to keep striving is there, yeah. Okay, well, thank you so much. Uh, we've been speaking with Archbishop William Laurie. Uh, we're hoping for a calmer day in Baltimore, a peaceful day, and we'll all be praying for that. Thank you so much for visiting with us here at americamagazine.org today. Appreciate thank you. Bye-bye.